You are listening to the IoT for All Media Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IoT for All podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Chacon, and on today's episode, we have Taylor Cooper, the CEO of Misty West. Misty West is a product development partner that acts as a bridge from lab to assembly line for intelligent and connected devices. Super interesting company. Uh, you'll learn a lot about that in our conversation. Um, and aside from that, we actually talk a lot about the role service, service firms play in IoT. What do they do? How do they compare? Um, we talk about the chip shortages because it influences pretty much everybody um, and, and how that's playing a role in IoT, the future expectations on that front, other trends in IoT we discuss, um, and then also challenges they've seen on the IoT engineering side of things. So all in all, fantastic conversation that I think you'll get a lot of value out of. But before we get into this episode, if any of you out there are looking to enter the fast growing and profitable IoT market, but don't know where to start, check out our sponsor, Leverage. Leverage's IoT solutions development platform provides everything you need to create turnkey IoT IoT products that you can white label and resell under your own brand. To learn more, go to iotchangeseverything.com. That's iotchangeseverything.com. And without further ado, please enjoy this episode of the IoT for All podcast. Welcome, Taylor, to the IoT for All podcast. Thanks for being here this week. Yeah, great to be here. Thank you for inviting us, Ryan. Absolutely. So let's start off by having you give a quick introduction to our audience, uh, background experience, anything could be relevant about you. Yeah, so uh, my name is Taylor Cooper. I'm an engineering physicist by training out of the uh, University of British Columbia. Um, and I've spent the last 15 years doing product development hardware. Um, I started off working at a molecular um, diagnostics company, building instrumentation for doing um, cell-free uh, DNA detection for cancer diagnostics. So lots of interesting hardware problems there. Um, lots of science. Um, and I moved over um, about seven years ago to a company called Misty West, which I'm now CEO of. Um, at Misty West, we've worked on a whole range of things, um, largely in the IoT space, but with a leaning towards kind of um, deep tech. So mm. places where it helps to have some understanding of the underlying science. Um, so tell us a little, yeah, yeah, feel free to tell us a little bit more about Misty West and kind of what you all do, like what, what um, kind of role and you play in the industry, value you provide, that kind of thing. Yeah, so we're an engineering services provider. Um, we primarily help people who have a novel idea um, um, productize that. So we, we mm. productize great innovation would be a really quick way to say it. Um, and I have some I have some examples I can throw out there, but... Um, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, definitely do that. Okay, so uh, one of the more interesting examples we're working on right now um, is for a company that's trying to build uh, basically an X-ray technology for the Earth. So um, a good analogy would be um, if you think of what um, medical imaging has done for heart surgery. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, instead of getting you know a, a triple bypass, you can potentially get a stent surgery and be in and out of the hospital in a day. That whole workflow is enabled by you know advanced medical imaging technologies like MRI. This company that we're working for, they want to do the same thing, but for um, mining. So if right now, how they figure out what's in the ground is very much based on drilling. They'll drill a bunch of holes, see what you get. It's a very um, luck-based approach. Um, there's other technologies that they use, but they don't do basically line of sight imaging. So you can't really okay. see what's in there. What these guys want to do is use technology out of particle accelerators. Um, so basically technology for detecting cosmic radiation, specifically muons, um, to image up to a kilometer of rock. So if you can imagine you deploy these sensors underground in a borehole and you wait for a while and eventually cosmic rays will hit that thing. And from those cosmic rays, you can infer what they pass through. So you can tell what the density of the rock around that is. Um, so in terms of how this is impactful, um, it allows you to do much more efficient exploration, um, mm -hmm. but it also allows, you can imagine, minimally invasive uh, resource sure. extraction. So instead of having to dig up a gigantic section to get, um, you know, just a little bit of ore, you can target it. So it's more efficient um, and it's really more relevant uh, given our transition to sustainable uh, energy generation. So renewable energy, um, you know, you need minerals, you need mining to make that happen. You can't build solar panels or wind turbines without, uh, you know, metals uh, right. or, or, or lithium power cars. So they're, they're kind of answering that whole challenge. Um, in terms of what Misty US does there, um, you know, we, we provide full stack engineering services. So we're helping them go from, you know, an experiment in the lab to, and a first prototype that's like a one by one meter cube um 
down to something that's 10 centimeters in diameter and can, can go into a borehole. So we're miniaturizing all of their electronics and we're um, basically turning that into an IoT solution where, um, where they can um, you know, connect to a dashboard and monitor an entire fleet of devices. So going from like one research experiment to hundreds or thousands of right, devices right. in the field. Um, and you are, and, and so you're providing the engineering services part. Is that all done in house? Do you work with partners? How does that usually work? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's all done in house, um, wow, okay. and you know, we'll we offer we have mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, firmware, software, the, the whole shebang. Um, you know, we don't do a lot of the design side, so like front end engineering, we don't right. really do that. Um, we the ID that we do is kind of more focused on like industrial and um, like user experience. It's less on cosmetics. Gotcha. Um, yeah. We'll also work with our clients to help them build out a team. So for this client, an example, you know, as an example, like as they've grown and as they've scaled, we'll, we'll help them to actually hire up their own engineering team where it makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, that, it's an important point that you really have to think about carefully when you're launching an IoT product is like, you know, where do we want to be experts? Where does it sure. make sense to get sure. expert, expert help? Um, and that's also a role that will help our clients, um, you know, try to figure their way through. And do you all um, have a focus when it comes to certain industries and areas that you all try to kind of stick within from an expertise standpoint, or are you kind of more horizontal? Yeah, we we kind of think of it in two ways. You know, our, the technology we work on is kind of horizontal. Um, okay. You know, we, we kind of have uh, two horizontal technologies that we work on. They're still quite broad, um, but we have a group that works on, um, you know, embedded vision. Um, and this you know, tomography solution really is an, a fairly niche application of embedded vision. It has a lot of the same challenges. You know, you need, uh, I won't go too much into the tech unless you <laughs> want me to, but um, you, you need to you need to have an FPGA reading out a bunch of photodiodes effectively. Okay. So it's, it's very similar. And then the other group that we have um, focuses more on the low power side. So very low power wearables, things like that. Um, you know, okay. we're working with... Um, some of ST microelectronics latest uh, IMUs where they have like an ML core enabled IMU. Right, so you can right. do gesture recognition without really turning on the MCU or anything like that. So you can, you can run these very low power gesture recognition applications on a wrist okay. or on something small. Very cool. So let me ask you then when we're talking about kind of an engineering services firm in the IOT landscape, um, talk to me a little bit about kind of how that compares to, how companies in IoT or with IoT deployments have gotten the engineering work done in the past and maybe even still do now, but the, you know, how you kind of compare to other avenues companies can go down to have the, to have the engineering work done. Yeah, totally. I, I think there's, there's a few options. I mean, it depends where, where you are. Like if you're sure. at a large company, you're going to, you're going to do different things. And if you're a, a lone founder or a startup, um, um, but in terms of the options, you know, they're generally like the obvious one, hire up some staff, either, you know, if you're a startup, you might be equity might be a significant piece of that comp. If you're a mm -hmm. large company, you know, you're, you're going to be hiring on salary and things like that. Um, and then another option, obviously, is to hire sole proprietors or contractors to do the work. Um, and then another option is to hire, hire firms like us. Um, in terms yeah. of, you know, what we advise our clients to do really is to think about their product development roadmap. And think about where they are in terms of you know their business objectives and financing right. so you know it, it's expensive to bring in an engineering services firm like ours um but we really help you you know shift that new product introduction curve to the left get to okay. market way faster okay um and, and another thing a lot of our clients find and this is a particularly true in medical devices um is that you know you develop all the tech and all the design work's done, and then you need to go to market and mm -hmm. see, you know, where the fit is, who you're going to sell it to, and you don't need a whole design team sitting on a bench. And you're, and if you're a small company or a small initiative, you know, it can be difficult to find things for that design team to do. And right. that's really the the hole that we fill is, you know, when you don't have a product development roadmap where you're developing some core IP that you really want to sure. keep internal, and sure. you have, you know. A really long stretch of development these people can do if it's you know when when you have like a year-long project or something like that and then you need to wait a bit that's where it really makes sense mm -hmm. to bring an engineering services firm and then when you when you have a project that's smaller you know if it's just a one-person engineering problem mm -hmm. um, it can make sense to bring in a contractor or if you have a really experienced engineering leader 
Um, you know, sure. we've seen our clients, some of our clients or, or helped our clients take that experienced engineering leader and build a team around them and go from there. So when companies kind of talk about, you know, building an IoT solution and they're thinking about platforms and they're thinking about the hardware and the firmware and all the different pieces that go into it, where do you feel like an engineering firm like yours really adds the most value? Um, because are you all building on top of your own platform or are you utilizing other platforms to kind of build the solution on? How does that kind of mix in with what, when we talk about IoT, it's oftentimes around those other areas. So this is definitely a unique angle to kind of understand the, the moving pieces. Yeah, totally. I, I think, um, you know, the ideal engineering partner has, you know, definitely had experience rolling similar projects. Okay. The only exception to that is, and, and ideally they're bringing, potentially bringing some IP, potentially not. I mean, usually one of the advantages is working with an engineering services provider is it's usually fee for service. So you keep all of that IP. Um, mm. Whereas, you know, if you work with an OEM or an ODM out of Asia, you're really at their mercy a bit. Like if your needs align really well with what it is they're doing, then it can be great. But we've seen with a lot of our clients where they want tweaks for power, performance or they want to add a feature or like one of them wanted to go intrinsically safe on a, on a risk wearable and like that is a huge ask and the odm said they would do it but once they got into it like it was just too much work and like sure. if you're not hitting hitting their moq they're just not going to spend time on you um so that that's a place um you know where where it can make where you know ideally you're finding an engineering services firm that has expertise right. in the area you're looking for right right okay now i wanted to pivot a little bit here and talk about a, a major topic uh, as it relates to iot solution development lately has been the chip shortages that we're seeing in the space and just across the board um in many different industries from going and buying a car you're hearing about it to you know technologies and, and industries that are not as connected to iot but in the IoT space particularly, what are you all seeing as far as how that chip shortage is playing a role in IoT solutions getting to market? How do you expect that to kind of continue to unfold or change or improve? Um, and then what advice do you have for companies mitigating kind of that situation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a very relevant challenge for a lot of our clients. Um, um, so, I mean, and across the board, really, it, it's it's worse, as you said, in automotive components or components that are industrially rated. Um, so, you know, that this this uh, Mion tomographer project I was talking about, they were very heavily impacted by this. We did see it coming um, back in April, so we were lucky to be able to risk buy some of those key components you just can't do anything without. Um, and we are seeing, you know, the signs that things are starting to come back in stock, like. Uh, I could share a link later, but there's a, a Raspberry Top Pi tracker for CM4s that someone put together. And you can see, I think the last time I checked it a couple of days ago, um, there were a few places that were starting to report that they had inventory. But we also have, you know, clients that were using the CM3 or the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 3. And they had an order that was supposed to arrive in April, get pushed to September and August, and now it's just not going to be fulfilled. Um, so there are some things where they're like end of life products earlier. Um, generally, you know, the advice we give our clients is, um, you know, previously sourcing would be an exercise that you might start later in the, in the product development life cycle. So you might actually build a proof of concept or an MVP and then check on sourcing. What we advise all of them to do now is to start with a strategic sourcing exercise. So look at the lead times of all your critical components, single source components, and plan accordingly right from the beginning. Um, and that's one thing we're doing. The other thing we're doing right now is um, there are, so so in the SOC space, so the system owner chip space, um, there's particular shortfalls. So some of the things I mentioned, like um, Raspberry Pi can be module fours. Um, NXP is also um, struggling to provide components. Um, so one thing we've actually started doing and kind of get back to your earlier question is building up um, some of our own IP. And we're actually in the process right now of building a SOM um, with some Renesas components, which are available. So the, the G2L and the V2L are the two parts we're looking at. Um, okay. But basically, you know, they have very similar performance to um, some of these Raspberry Pi like systems. Right. Um, and they're there. You can actually buy the chips right now. And the V2L oh, wow. actually has some some innovative technology in it. And then it has a neural um, processing unit for, sure. for running very low power, like Jetson Nano level in terms mm. of flops, um, right. very low power um, 
uh, image recognition and, and object detection at mm -hmm. the edge, which is something that's useful for a lot of people we work with. Fantastic. And through those conversations you're having with the companies, I mean, we, we talked briefly here about the chip shortages, but what other trends and things are you all seeing from your perspective in the industry um, as it relates to maybe what we're seeing happen now or where we see it potentially going uh, when it, at, uh, in the IoT space particularly? Because I think you have a very unique um, per perspective in this as opposed to a lot of the other guests that I've talked to. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing that I'd like to reference occasionally is some of Cisco's market research. I think back in, this might have been like 2008 or 2010, where they were predicting the market cap for IoT like 10 years down the road. Yeah. And I think that they predicted like, I don't remember the exact number offhand, but it might have been like 20 billion or 100 billion or whatever it was. Um, and they were off by, I think, like a factor of 50 percent. Um, hmm. So the, the IoT moved a lot slower than they were thinking. And I, I think this trend is continuing in that, like, you know, the, the solutions people need to their IoT problems, they tend to be very specific. You know, we're not seeing the same trends we saw with smartphones, where, okay. you know, a smartphone is a smartphone is a smartphone. In okay. IoT, the solutions tend to be very application specific. Sure. And they have very specific needs. Um, so that that is definitely a trend we're seeing. And we're also seeing, you know, more and more specialized in these technologies coming out, like these neural processing units I was mentioning, for example, there's there's got to be over 100 firms that I'm aware of, um, not that I can name, but that I've looked up over in the past who are developing different unique neural processing units. Um, that's a big trend in, I in IoT right now, right? It's like, how do we make edge devices more intelligent? Um, right. And and the, and there's a lot of diversity in that market, and it might not consolidate um, in in the way that well. I mean, it will probably eventually consolidate, but like it, we're a long ways away from that market consolidating. Sure. Um, so Renesas is building their own MPU, but there are also companies you know everywhere in the world in Israel and California who are building these, um, and they're targeting different applications. There's a group mm -hmm. in I forget the name offhand. There's a group in California where they have, I think like a three year battery life on a camera. Mm. Um, so it's very it's a low res camera but like it's that opens some interesting yeah, ideas right sure. like what if you what if you can just you want to have a people counter in a room right it's right. bluetooth connected you slam you just stick it to the corner it's just it's a small little device you can stick yep. on with a piece of tape you leave it for three mm -hmm. years and you know what what the what the occupancy of that room is yeah um definitely yeah I, i'm 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 kind of curious to see how things continue to progress in the space but as we kind of think about the opposite side of that, not just the the trends and things that we're seeing, but there are also a lot of challenges that I think companies are currently facing. From your perspective, are there any specific challenges that relate more or you're seeing more regularly for, as an engineering services firm um, that may be worth kind of bringing up and discussing and also sharing how companies can overcome those challenges? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, oh, we've got some guests. Um, <laughs> yeah, the... Um, the um, yeah, in terms of challenges we're seeing, I mean, you know, the chip shortage is a big one. I think the the labor market right now um, is really tight as well, um, and there are some specific challenges on that front, um, particularly um, finding um, software developers with IoT experience. So actually building a scalable IoT solution on like Azure IoT or AWS IoT um, is challenging, um, just okay. because it's, it's difficult to even find the people who can do the work. Right. Um, so that that's a challenge. Um, another interesting trend. Well, I, that's a trend, not challenge. What are the challenges? Are there? Um, How about like yeah, um, kind of the the buy in <clears throat> side of things when you're working with companies and their expectation of what they think is possible versus what is actually reality from your end, and then the buy in they have to have from other stakeholders within the organization to move things forward. Did that ever come come into play and kind of ever cause any issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I can give examples from our current clients there. Um, you know, it, it can be, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where hard, hardware moves a little slow. So like, mm -hmm. you know, people are moving towards, you know, this lean model of, or they're already there. Lean has been around for forever. Sure. But like, how, how do you, how do you do lean hardware? Right. And, and how do okay. you get, how do you build something that you can use to get buy in above you quickly? Um, yeah. and get it to scale through a company. It's a real challenge. Um, that's a place where we we always try to stay super lean and, and help our clients as well. Um, yeah. You know, one example is like we, we might, well, I don't, 
it's kind of specific, but um, one of our, one of the companies we're working with, they want to do um, basically, they want to add a, a sensor package to uh, uh, a facial uh, product that they're doing. So it's like a, uh, it's like an applicator you apply to the face. It removes blackheads and applies lotion. Interesting. Um, so they they want to build a whole sensor package for that, but they don't. It's really hard to know what they want there. Like they want to say do force sensing because they want to know if the esthetician is pushing too hard on your face. Right. Um, so getting a force sensor on the front of that into a small enough package is a real challenge. Sure. Um, so you know it's the kind of thing where we'll we'll just build something that is um, really janky, three D printed, and it won't work well. But like. You try to get it out the door, put something in hands as quickly as possible so that you can try to validate with real customers. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to kind of get a sense of what challenges you all face and see, um, or I guess as you all, I mean my guests, from different perspectives in the industry. But there's also a lot of similarities between a lot of the challenges you all face. Um, and it's always interesting to learn more. So I really appreciate you kind of shedding light on those. Um, for our audience out there that's listening and wants to learn more about Miss US and kind of get a sense of, of you know, follow-up questions, connect, anything like that, what's the best way to do that for them? Yeah, the best way to reach out, um, you can send me an email, taylor at mistus.com. Okay. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, and then uh, there's a the company LinkedIn is not a bad way to reach us. Um, sure. And then there's obviously the webpage, which is just mistus.com. Okay. There's a, there's a contact us, all of that. Yeah. Happy to talk to anyone about hardware anytime. Um, cool. You know, we're... And um, uh, anything coming out over the next number of months that we should be on the lookout for coming from you? I know you have uh, the, the awards things that's been going on, which is really cool. Um, anything else kind of on the horizon? Yeah, we have a, an IoT award that we're presenting. We've actually got a few big sponsors there. Um, nice. I think <clears throat> I think SolidWorks, um, Adafruit, uh, okay. there's one other big sponsor. I think there's like a 15k um, cash prize in there. Okay. So you know, if you're if you're building a novel uh, hardware product or IoT solution, um, you should check it out. Um, just Google the Misties, M I S T I E S. Um, the other thing yep. to call out, um, which we will be posting more about, is that um, that SOM that we're working on. So a Renaissance mm -hmm. SOM. So basically mm -hmm. for people who are right now using uh, like low to mid volume SOCs that they can't order like a NXPI MX8 or a CM3 or CM4. Sure. We're planning on releasing a solution that's compatible with that kind of thing. Um, we're going to try and do pin compatibility with the CM4 actually. Um, but if you're having trouble finding those parts, um, send me an email, let me know, and uh, maybe we can help. Sounds good. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation, Taylor. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, looking forward to getting this out to our audience and love to have you back. We're doing some more series around kind of the hardware side, more of the technical conversation. So we'll have to make sure we, we get you into those series as well, because I think there's a lot of uh, insights you could definitely provide value to our audience and um, we'd love to have you back. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Taylor. All right. All right, everyone, thanks again for watching that episode of the IoT for All podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and be sure to hit the bell notification so you get the latest episodes as soon as they become available. Other than that, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.